I'm Dave Palumbo, founder of Species Nutrition. From my earliest bodybuilding days, I believed in only putting the best in my body. And that lives on in the Species Nutrition line of products. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Hey guys, we're super excited to be here at the LA Fit Expo. It's our third year in a row. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be launching a tasty pastry. It's a low-carb Pop-Tart. It's got three to four grams of net carbs. And we love this show. This is our best place to be in LA. She was killed. And uh, they tried the top to cover six girls it up. really look great, but you seem to have that perfect aesthetic. I wasn't look. in the hip hop or even soul music. There are definitely people that ha need a little Viagra. Welcome to Heinz Seniors Coaching Up. Get access to the P3AK High Intensity Training eBook and its exclusive video tutorials. Commit with Heinz's coaching right now and be provided with a year of meal plans, training programs, and more. www.p3akday.com. There is no room for the littles. Rx Muscle, and you're watching us on YouTube. I am Tyler, in for Sid this week. And uh, yeah, I'll still be doing the questions as usual. Uh, Dave, we just got off that interview with Sean Clarita, officially the giant killer now, huh? He has slain the big boys, as they say. And uh, thank you, uh, Tyler, for sitting in for us. Uh, Sid is a little out of commission this week, and he will be back, as usual, next week. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love Sean Clarita. I've known him since like he first started competing pretty much. And uh, he used to come to all the bros versus pros uh, challenges we used to do back in the day. And even when he started like really competing at a high level and didn't want to do them anymore, he would always come and show support, especially when we were in New Jersey. And so it's great to see him not only win the 212 Olympia last year, but win his first open show and qualify for the regular Mr. Olympia. I, I'm dying to see him do the Mr. Olympia. I really hope they allow him to do both divisions. Why they have this silly, silly rule that you have to pick one or the other is absolutely ridiculous. Obviously, Hadi Shupin a couple of years ago qualified for both divisions and they made him pick one or the other. He picked the open, which was a good move on his part, obviously. But if you qualify in both, which is very difficult to do, okay, anyone who's competed at an elite IFBB level knows to win a pro show is very, very, very tough. If you can do that, you deserve to do both. And so I don't know what the, this cockamamie rule is, but hopefully, you know, times change, you know, rules evolve. Hopefully they'll, uh, they'll see the wisdom of that and, and make that change. Very good. Well, you guys know the drill. Let's get right into it with the first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, I heard some tricks backstage immediately before competing, like sipping Gatorade plus salt, sip coffee plus salt, sip coffee, sip wine. Do you recommend some of this or any of this? You know, it, it's um, the tricks are only used when things are going wrong usually. So I don't like to do things just like weird stuff unless it's necessary. Now, if someone is calling me on the phone and I'm not at the show and they're like, Dave, I'm cramping like crazy. I'm gonna give them salt backstage. A lot of times I'll have them actually take a teaspoon of salt and put it maybe in an ounce or two of water and drink that down. Um, if someone tells me they're falling asleep backstage and, they can't, and, they, and they're so tired, of course I might give them a little shot of espresso or something like that. If they're cramping and they're tired, maybe I'll put the salt in the espresso. That would be, you know, you see I think what happens is people sit backstage and they see someone do coo something kooky like that and they think, well, everyone should do that because that's what works great. No, it only works if you need it. If you're cramping, then you're obviously low on sodium especially if you're using only diazide. If you're not cramping and you put sodium, you know, put a lot of sodium or, or drink a lot of sodium, it, it could make you worse. So you really want to go by how you feel and how you look and make those changes. I never liked alcohol backstage. It, it's, it's hit or miss. Now, if someone's a, an absolute train wreck because they're so stressed out of their mind, you know, maybe a, a couple swigs of like a little bit of a hard alcohol might calm them down a little bit. I remember there was a show once that I did. Um, it was the, U actually it was my first USA Championships ever. It was in 1995, Phil Hernan, may he rest in peace, won that show. Craig Titus threw his trophy. We all know that story. And uh, I was an absolute wreck. I was like, I must have been the worst person to be in the hotel room with. 
And the, my girlfriend at the time was like going out of her mind and she called up um, Steve Stone. May he rest in peace. Uh, Steve was a great guy. Back then he really wasn't running the backstage shows. He wasn't expediting. He was just kind of would go to the shows and help out. And he was covering it for Muscle Sport USA, which is the, um, it was a TV show that they were doing at the time. And so she called up Steve because she knew we were all friends. And she's like, Steve, he must, she, must, she didn't tell me this. She must have told him that I'm driving her crazy. I'm looking in the mirror every two seconds. And I'm, I, don't, I'm, I think I'm holding water. And he came to the room and he, and he brought me a glass of wine. And I, I, don't, I never touched alcohol back then. He's like, drink this. I'm like, ah. He's like, you're going to look better. And what it did was it made me actually fall asleep. Because I, was, I wasn't sleeping enough because I was really stressed out. And it relaxed me. And, um, and I woke up like an hour and a half later and I looked amazing. So... You know, stress raises cortisol levels. So, you know, you have to kind of go by how, what's going on. Don't just do these kooky things that you see other people doing because you think it's going to make you look better. It could make you look worse. And second question, again, from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, how do you recommend to train the week before a competition, as in weights and cardio? Okay, you know, I get this question a lot. And you know what, you know, I, I used to... When I first started, you know, everyone gave me the, the quote protocol. You know, you got to train, you got to deplete the whole body, you can do whole body workouts, you know, the week of the show to really deplete down. But the truth is that most people who are, you know, getting ready for a show and who are in shape are probably pretty depleted already, you know, and you're probably on pretty low carbs unless you have a really gifted metabolism. So there's really no reason to over deplete or overdo it. So what I tell people is a week out from the show, if you, let's say you have a Saturday morning show, a uh, prejudging. The week before, seven days before, should be your last leg workout. So like Saturday or Sunday is, is usually a good, uh, a good last leg workout. And then whatever comes next. So if Monday is chest, you know, you, you know, what I would do is I would figure, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are my last three training days because you don't train Thursday and Friday before a Saturday show. So I'm going to take, I have to cover shoulders, back, arms, uh, and uh, what did I forget? Uh, chest. So I'll break those, you know, I'll, I'll figure it out. So I'll, usually I'll do like biceps and chest, triceps, and back, and then I'll do shoulders on Thursday, and that's it. So, and I'm not doing like heavy, heavy weights at that point, and I'm not doing a million sets, because I don't want to over, because you don't want to over break down the muscle, because the muscle needs to heal by Saturday so it looks the best it could look. That's why a lot of times guys look better um, than the week after the show, because they've actually stopped doing so much cardio, they've rested, they haven't really worked out, and the muscles heal up. So if your muscles are still all broken down, they're not going to look their best and show their best detail. And that's why I never understood why guys would train the day before a show. I mean, it's just ridiculous. The only time I could ever justify going into the gym a day before a show would be if you're like overcarbed. For some reason, you guys made a mistake, you overcarbed and you spilled over, and there's too much glycogen there, and, and, and you got to knock some of it down. Okay, and you might go into the gym and do really light weights and just high repetitions and try to burn some of that, um, that glycogen off. But that's risky too because that cause because muscle you know when you break down muscle you create inflammation and inflammation blurs the definition so you really shouldn't do anything just like also the week of a show you should not get a massage don't go for a deep tissue massage three days out from your show because that's breaking down more muscle tissue i was so neurotic this is true true story that i wouldn't if 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 my girlfriend would put her hands on my neck to give me a massage i'd be like get your hands off my like i would i was so crazy that i thought she was going to break down muscle um, and that I wouldn't be as hard on stage. That, that's how nuts I was, okay? So you don't need to be that crazy, but, but don't get deep tissue massages. Don't do anything crazy the week of show, and don't train your legs um, after like six or seven days out from the show. Let's go now to our Instagram feed questions. If you're not already following us, we are official underscore RX Muscle. First question from Taylor Vation. Dave's thoughts on pullovers as first back exercise to pre-fatigue without biceps engagement. I don't have the machine, so would decline dumbbell pullovers work? You know, um, pullovers are an interesting exercise. The problem with pullovers is that if you don't have the right angle and the right type of machine or and or you know dumbbell setup to do it. A lot of times you're kind of wasting your time. Probably an inclined dumbbell is probably better than just the old way we used to go over the bench. Originally we used to lean over a bench and we'd grab a dumbbell and we'd pull it over. And we they said it was to expand your rib cage, you know. Louis Ferrigno said that's how he got his chest so big. We also we all did that movement. Then Dorian came along and said the pullovers are really for your lats, and which if you make sense, you're pulling from your lats. So that's actually probably way more true. Now 
in certain angles, you can get some chest engagement, but and you do feel like a stretch here in, in, in the ribs. I don't know if that actually expands your rib cage or as much as it just gives you a nice stretch there. But to me, and I, I, I'm going to stick with what Dorian said, the Nautilus pullover machine seemed to have been where you kind of grab the handle. It's kind of like a pad here, and you kind of push from your from from here, your forearm, to bring the bar down and, and pull it over you and you really feel it in the, these lats that kind of flare from the front. And that's why Dorian had really good development right here in the front part of his lats. And I think that was from heavy, with perfect form, pullovers on the Nautilus machine. I remember when he used to come to Weinberger's gym in uh, New York, Steve had the old Nautilus pullover machine there, which was worked impeccably. It was, was chain-driven and everything, like just like the old one. I mean, it was exact. It was just like a refurbished old one, I guess, or or one that just was in really good shape. But I actually, in the gym I train at now, Crunch, they have a, a new Nautilus line. I don't know how they bought the name, or whatever, but they have a pullover machine. It's not chain-driven anymore, but it still feels pretty good. And I've been doing it recently because I finally am back in the gym, and this this pullover machine is very smooth, works well. So yeah, it's a good first movement. You can do, I usually do it as a first movement. You can do it as a last movement too if you really want to. Um, I think the mistake people make is they go too heavy with that machine. And if you go too heavy, you start cheating, you know? And so you really want to pull from the lats. You don't want to be pushing from your arms because then you get your shoulders involved somehow. You, trust me, it's not the amount of weight you use. It's the technique with that and to, and to get the good stretch. So yeah, I mean, it's not going to, you know, I, I don't think you can compare it to you know, bent rows or pull downs as far as lat, you know, width and thickness, but I think it adds another dimension to the lats, more from the front, because you really feel it in that front part of the lat. And the lat is a very, the latissimus dorsi are very big muscles. They, they insert down by your waist, they come all the way up, you know, the top, and then insert up here. You can feel them under your armpit, you know. So they're a very big muscle. It's hard to hit the whole lat by using one specific exercise. That's why. It's nice to vary the exercises that you do when you're training your back so that you kind of hit different parts of it. You know, like one-arm rows or one-arm cable rows really hit the low, you can really target those lower lats. Um, Pull-downs, obviously, you're gonna hit more of a mid-lat. You know, um, if you do any kind of um, rowing machine with, with the pad here, you know, you're gonna hit, you can hit those rhomboids in the middle because it kind of isolates, uh, isolates here and keeps you from moving. So, vary it. But, I think that the uh, pullover machine, if you have one, is, is, is pretty good. I don't know if you're going to quite get the same effect from doing them over a decline bench. But if you're feeling your lats working, the problem is when you're using a dumbbell, and you, at some point when you're over your head, you lose tension on the lats. Whereas on a machine that has, you, you, you seem to keep that tension. I just feel it better. Um, but like I said, sometimes you got to make use of what you have available. And if you have no machines available, use the dumbbell. Going over to MorganMac.Bodybuilding, how to train to improve muscle separation on an already developed physique, parentheses, IFBB pro level. What are your thoughts on why some top guys lack muscle separation on stage, even though they are in good condition? You know, that's a good question. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, people mistake, you know, veiny, pumped up muscle to be shredded muscle. I have veins, I had veins at 300 pounds that probably, you know, not many other people ever had. And some people mistook that for conditioning and they used to say, you should be, you should be competing at 300 pounds. But I know I didn't have the muscle separation at that weight because I really wasn't quite as lean as I appeared. It just looked good because I was so freaky looking with the, you know, how many, you know, how veiny I was and my skin was very thin. When I would get myself down to like 265, however, okay, now I had grooves and, and there were like there were like angles in the muscle that like that just weren't there at 300 pounds and, and it looked more impressive on stage when you're flexing and hitting your shots, you know, especially side chest shot, back double by, all these little fibery things are coming out that weren't there anymore. So I think a lot of guys are just not lean enough. Um, now, younger guys sometimes just don't have the muscle maturity yet. And so they look like they have all the right muscles in the right places, but it, for some reason, maybe they're missing what we would call separation. And you know, I, I remember a judge said to me once before, when I was in the beginning part of my career, and I was pretty big. I was like probably one of the biggest guys at that point, probably about two, almost 260 on stage. And 
he's like, you know, you need more separation in your legs. And I was like, what is this guy talking about? I had like the best legs on stage, you know, but I understood when I got, you know, when five or six, seven years passed and I, and I became, I actually was pretty much the same weight on stage, but all of a sudden when I flexed my leg down, I, there was stuff that was popping out of my legs that just weren't there when I was in my 20s. So in my early 30s, I, I got that level of muscle maturity. And what happens is when the muscle grows, it gets longer. So at some point, it fills out. And it can't get any fuller or longer. So what happens is it starts to create like grooves on itself. It gets like more three-dimensional. And that's what muscle maturity is. That's what you know creating separation in the muscle is all about. Because the muscle is actually changing its, its, its shape. It's like getting twisted and, and getting more bumpy and, and curvy and... Because it can't get longer anymore, you know, and that's and that's just like I said, comes with training. You can't you can't make that happen faster. You can get big faster if you eat properly and train and take the right gear, but you can't get muscle maturity. You can't. It's like you, so you can go buy followers on Instagram, but you can't make the, these fake followers click on your and like your and like your post, right? You, you got to actually get people to do that. So same thing with muscle. You have to you have to put the work in. Quite the analogy. On to building, <laughs> yeah, building and wrestling. B building and wrestling. Hi, Hi Dave. Du- got it. During a diet, when you have to train heavy, especially legs, and you don't have it in you, can you use lighter weights with more reps or drop sets to still keep it intense? No training partner. Yeah, I mean, I think that 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 would be the wise thing to do. The one, and I've told this story a million times. You know, we always have new people. So one time I went, I was, I had just started squatting six plates on each side, which is what five eighty five, and you know, which was a which was a milestone that I really, you know, took me a long time to get to because it's it, there's a psychological block against that much weight on your back, right? So I was got to the point where I was doing four or six reps every you know squat workout, and I came into the gym one day, and I had just been really tired, and I just didn't feel like training, it was getting later, and I was hungry, and I'm like, I don't think I'm gonna be able to squat, you know, God forbid I can't put six plates on every single time, right? So I had, we would take, at the time, the, the, there was the, one of the drugs that was around was called Andriol, or Androxin, it was like a, it was like a testosterone in like a, it looked like a vitamin E capsule, it was a, it was a very quick acting um, uh, testosterone, and it only lasted a couple hours in your system, and I took and they came in 40 milligram capsules. So you took a pill, you're supposed to take a pill every couple, like every three to four hours, you know, so like three to five a day. Um, and it would hit you fast. So I took two of them. I wasn't taking it, I wasn't cycling it, but I said, you know what, maybe it'll wake me up. So, so someone who had had them at the gym and was using them gave me two, I took two. And man, did I get strong and did I get aggressive from this stuff. And I got into that six plates and then it felt like nothing. But I, would, I knew my body wasn't ready for it and I went down maybe on the fourth or fifth rep and I felt my quads start to separate. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have ever felt that. A lot of times you feel it when you do a bench and the weight's a little heavy. And I just, luckily I stopped before I tore my quad, obviously. But what that uh, lesson taught me was that when your body's not ready to lift the weight, you don't do, take stuff to make yourself stronger or do it anyway because that's how you get hurt. That's like when you're traveling and you're getting on a plane and you're not sleeping as much, and you're in a, maybe in another state or another country, you don't go to the gym and try to break records there because that's how you get hurt because your body is not in tip-top shape. Um, when I was lifting these crazy heavy weights, I was sleeping nine hours a day and I was taking a nap. I was eating you know, eight times a day. I, I had everything perfect. You know, I, I, There was nothing out of place. I wasn't stressed out. I was... I was doing what I had to do to, to do the weight I needed, to, to do my job essentially in the gym. If I wasn't doing that and I wasn't sleeping enough or if I wasn't recovering well, I would have gotten hurt. You know, I tell people I really never got hurt in the gym aside from a little tweak here and there because I was so focused. You know, we get hurt when we're out of the gym walking, slipping on ice or on a staircase, you know, like I did with my quad because we're not paying attention. When you're in the gym, it's all business and so don't try to set records when you don't feel up to it. Absolutely lighten the weights up. You might not even want to do higher reps because sometimes that'll also be, cause a problem because here you are, you don't feel up to what you're doing and you, you, now you're pushing your body just in a different direction, in a direction that you're not used to doing, which is maybe you don't do high reps on a regular basis. So now you might get sloppy in your form and hurt yourself. So just lighten the weights and do the same workout you would normally do and preserve yourself. And then the next time you get back to the gym the week after, you can always hit it hard. Let's go to 
Oh, I'm going to butcher this one. Bailal Hamide. Hey Dave, what's your recommendation for carbs and protein ratio for clean bulking? Currently weighing at 198 pounds lean. I mean, I always say about a, a gram and a half of protein per pound, you know, for, for putting muscle on. You know, so if you're 200, he's 200, he's 200 pounds, he's 100 yeah. kilograms. So if he's 200 pounds, then, then I would take in at least 300 and uh, about 300 grams of protein. And for carbs, it really depends on how, what kind of a carb burner you are. If you, you know, I try to start guys off with about, you know, one gram to 1.5 grams of carbs per pound. So I'd probably start him off on 250, 300 grams of carbs a day and see how he does. If he starts getting fat on that, I'm going to cut it back. If he's, if he's looking too flat on that, I'm going to up that. Um, but it's important also when you're trying to grow to make sure you get enough fat. And so I think it's important to get at least a half a gram of fat per pound that you weigh. So if you're 200 pounds, you want to get at least at least 100 grams of fat per day spread out, you know, over whatever, you know, five or six meals, whatever it is. Or, you know, you know, if you want, you can do a little bit more than that. Like I, I probably always went about 150. If I weighed 200 pounds, I would go 150 grams of fat um, just because my body seems to need more fat to recover and I ate less carbs. So you got to basically figure out what your body needs and then give it to it. If, you're, if you get fat real easy, don't eat too many carbs. Eat a little bit more fat. Protein has always got to be high. That's, that's a, a non-negotiable type of thing. Over to Brigantor underscore one. Dave, what are your thoughts on IGF-1 for older people? You know, there's, there's, some, there's some debate about IGF-1 in older people because, you know, te technically older people, I guess, could be more prone to cancer because our immune systems don't function as well as younger people. And IGF-1, obviously, would, would, if you had an actively growing cancer in your body, it would make it grow faster, just like GH would do the same thing. And um, from a cancer perspective, if you don't really have a family history and you don't really have anything wrong with you, I, I, it's probably safe. Um, as, in, as someone who's getting older, from a rejuvenation standpoint, I think you'd be better off taking growth hormone rather than IGF-1 just because, and we don't even know all the effects of, you know, we know that GH causes the liver to produce IGF-1, right, which is, which is the growth component of, of, of the GH. There's some evidence to show, and there's some research to show that GH might have a direct effect on the muscles too. So if you want to get a more holistic or all-encompassing rejuvenation effect to the body, I would, take, I would take GH. And I also wouldn't take too much GH. You're better off taking it daily at a lower dosage than higher. Because when you take high doses of GH, it makes you insulin resistant. It makes your pancreas have to work harder to produce enough insulin to keep your blood sugars in check. As an older person, that could damage your, your, your pancreas. You might you know, make yourself a diabetic because you might put too much strain on those pancreatic cells to crank out extra insulin that they can't handle and they could burn themselves out. So I wouldn't take more than like two IUs a day if you're an older person. Tubby Geo, hi Dave. Would you count pre, intra, and post workout nutrition as part of a set six meal setup? Um, Usually what I do is I, when I start guys off on a, like a off-season type protocol, I'll do the pre-workout you know, and post-workout shake, you know, and then I'll do five more you know, feedings a day. Now, some of the, one of those might be a shake or two of those might be a shake, but depending on the person's schedule. So there's usually like seven feedings per day I start off with. If the person needs an eighth, then I go to an eighth. You know, for women, I probably would go to six. I would go the two shakes. or Usually with women, I don't do a pre-workout shake. I'll do a post-workout shake, and I'll do like five meals or four meals and a, sh and a, and a shake plus the, the post-workout shake. Once again, you gotta, when I sit down and I analyze a person's program as their coach, I'm gonna ask them what their schedule is. And if, if, they're, if they're a person who's in meetings all day long and they really can't eat a lot of food, I'm gonna give them more shakes. If they're a person, however, that ha makes their own schedule, they work from home, then I can kind of like craft their diet the way I want it to go. You know? And, and, and I, I like to give people more food but some people just can't eat. They don't have a good appetite. And they're like, please, Dave, can I get more shakes? And I'm like, absolutely. So I, I kind of cater the, 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 uh, the meal plan to based on you know, what their, their necessities are. Now, having said that, um, you know, not everyone needs a pre and post workout shake also. You know, some, people get, some people get fat from too many fast acting carbs. Most people, however, can handle the post workout shake because 
after you train, your body handles carbohydrates really, really well. So if you're going to do like a whey isolate with like a high molecular weight carbohydrate, like you know, like a Vitargo or my Carbolize product, for instance, you know that is usually tolerated pretty well and doesn't really lead to fat gain. However, sometimes pre-workout is too much, you know, for the person. They don't need that many carbs. So you got to go by the individual by individual. Dark skinned avatar. I'm on a keto diet and I've noticed that there is ammonia and ammonia smell when I eat protein and meat. Onions have the same effect. This doesn't happen when I'm not in ketosis. So what could be happening? Well, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're in a ketogenic state, you can sometimes have, you know, like um, uh, an acidosis going on, too much acidity, you know, in the body. And, and that sometimes can lead to the, you know, some, sometimes there's too much protein waste in the body and the body becomes very acidic and you, be, and you get that ammonia-ish breath because ammonia is the, is the breakdown product of protein. You know, nitrogen uh, turns into ammonia. Usually your body can detoxify that and get rid of it. The problem is sometimes it gets overwhelmed and it can't. And if you're breathing ammonia out, you're probably a little toxic. I would, what I would do is cut back my protein. You can stay on a ketogenic diet if you want, or you can go to a little bit, if you want to replace the protein you remove with a little bit of carbs for like a week or two, that's fine too. There's not, I sometimes will do that if the person has a fast metabolism. I might reduce their protein in half. So let's say they were eating 200 grams of protein or 250 grams of protein. I might go to a half that and then make up for it in carbohydrates. So in other words, take away, a, you know, three ounces of protein or four ounces of protein and add 30 grams of carbs in, in its place. And a lot of times that will, re that, that smell will go away. Now onions or garlic breath is a completely different phenomenon, okay, than being, you know, having that really nasty ammonia smell coming out. Because usually that ammonia is not only coming out of your breath, but it's coming out of your pores too, because your body doesn't know how to get rid of the ammonia, so it's just releasing it everywhere. You know, any kind of organ of, of elimination it's going to use. And think about the skin. The skin surface area is huge, so if, it just, if the body just releases ammonia out of the skin, it gets rid of it re very, very easily. The problem is you're going to stink, and you can't, it's not a mouthwash, you know, fix type of stink. It's because your, your body is just saying, hey, I'm toxic. And you got to cut back the protein in that situation. And usually, some of you only have to do it for a couple days. So cut it back until the smell goes away and your breath comes back to normal. And then you can go back to your, your ketogenic diet. So also, a lot of people, when they do a ketogenic diet, they overeat protein. You know, because they think, oh, well, I'm not eating carbs. I can eat 600 grams of protein a day. Well, you only weigh 200 pounds. You don't need, six, you don't need three times your body weight in protein. So even though you might not be, you know, you might still be losing weight or, or it's too much. So a lot of times also what I'll do is if a person wants to stay in ketosis, I might decrease their protein but increase their fat a little bit. And sometimes people are not eating enough fat, and that's the problem also. They're overeating protein. They think, oh, ketogenic, I'll just eat a lot more protein. I'll only eat a little bit of fat. But if you're eating a ton of protein thinking you're going to get your energy from the protein because some of it's going to convert to carbs, which is really going to screw up the ketosis, um, you're putting, it's, it's a very inefficient process. Your body's going to really you know, start once again, becoming toxic. And that's what's probably happening in this situation. Well, we are up against the clock at Tib with a, from what I hear, a pretty epic iron debate coming up very soon. But I was told to squeeze in these last two vital questions, so we'll do them as quickly as we can. From Mike Maverick 98 after leg day, I can never sleep the following night. Is it because it's a shock to the central nervous system? I end up spending all night <laughs> rolling around with restless leg syndrome. Please help. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that, I used to experience that all the time. I was like, my whole nervous system was completely traumatized. It was, it was, it was like, I, I couldn't relax and my legs were shaking, like he said. Um, very difficult uh, to deal with sometimes. And that's, that comes with the, you know, that comes with the uh, territory, so to speak. You could try to take something to relax yourself. A lot of times GABA helps. Uh, my Somalize product from Species Nutrition has a nice dose of GABA and melatonin. The GABA will relax those muscles, allow that, that restlessness to go away, and allow you to get a nice good night's sleep. And let's wrap this sucker up with Nadim Kawaji. Why does Ronnie Coleman at 300 pounds look more massive than Big Rami? I mean, you've met both of them, and both of them are mass monsters, so your opinion. <laughs> well, you know... I wouldn't want anyone to ever compare me to 
uh, Ronnie Coleman. So I'm sure I'm sure Big Randy probably doesn't want it either. Ran Ronnie was arguably the greatest of all time, and Ronnie had a lot more must dense muscle, meaning that yeah, Randy might be 300, but Ronnie's 300 was probably uh, a way more muscular 300. Because think about it, Rami never got as hard as Ronnie got. I mean, Ronnie was like zero percent body fat. If, if you know, there might he might have been negative body fat. So Rami never. So Rami probably is like, you know, two eighty if he was going to be completely crazy shredded. Whereas Ronnie was really like, you know, when he was in two thousand three, he was probably like two ninety five, you know, shredded. So he he theoretically is bigger than Rami, you know, and. His proportion is, is, is better than Rami, uh, meaning the way it, it, his body is laid out, you know, uh, and that's why he's the greatest of all time because he has structure and he has freaky conditioning and he had the most muscle per square inch, per height. And that, that's what made Ronnie so special. You know, Jay Cutler was huge. Jay was just as big as Ronnie, but it was the way Ronnie's muscle was put on his body. You know, even Flex Wheeler said it. You know, Flex Wheeler might have been one of the most genetically gifted guys in the sport and he even he said he goes I couldn't stand extra Ronnie just made me look like like I wasn't that special because Ronnie had such such bells and whistles out there that people couldn't take their eye off him and so that's you know that's when that's the difference between the greatest of all time and the greatest okay you, there is a separation and that is going to do it for this week's episode of Ask Dave thanks for letting me step in for Sid he'll be back next week of course and uh, yeah, I guess we'll get ready for Iron Debate. Uh, thanks for liking and subscribing and all that jazz, and we'll see you next time. Take it easy.